So, I'd like to give you a little introduction on our keynote speaker this morning. So, Dr. Murray has spent her career serving the medically underserved. She has worked in a variety of settings, including practicing occupational medicine at a workers' clinic in Canada, residency director for occupational medicine at Meharry Medical College, bureau chief for the Chicago Department of Health under Mayor Harold Washington. Dr. Murray served as medical director of the federally funded health center, Winfield Moody, serving Cabrini Green Public Housing Project in Chicago. Dr. Murray has been an active member of a wide range of local and national organizations, including serving as a member of the Board of Scientific Counselors for the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry, and the Board of Scientific Counselors for the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, and the Board of Directors of Trinity Health. She serves on the National Advisory Committee on Occupational Safety and Health. In 1997, Dr. Murray returned to the Cook County Health System, where she served as Chief Medical Officer, Primary Care, for the 23 primary care and community health centers comprising the Ambulatory and Community Health Network of the Cook County Bureau of Health Services. The Cook County Bureau of Health is one of the nation's largest public system of medical care and operates three hospitals, the three public health department for suburban Cook County, health services, a county jail, and the network of health centers operated by the county. Today she serves as, as the chief medical officer for the Cook County Department of Public Health of the Cook County Health and Hospital System, the state certified public health agency for suburban Cook County. She practices as a general internist at Woodlawn Health Center, is an attending physician in the Division of Occupational and Environmental Medicine at Cook County Hospital, and an adjunct assistant professor at the University of Illinois School of Public Health. She plays a leadership role in many organizations, including the National Association of City and County Health Officers, Health Equity and Social Justice Team, the National Executive Board of American Public Health Association, and serves on the board of the Chicago-based Health and Medicine Policy Research Group. She remains passionate about increasing the number of black and Latino health professionals and serves as the co-chair for the Urban Health Pro Program Community Advisory Committee at the University of Illinois. In November 2010, Dr. Murray became president of the American Public Health Association. She has been a voice for social justice and health care as a basic human right for over 40 years. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Murray. I was uh, looking at your, your program before I arrived, and since I've gotten here, you have a great conference scheduled. I really am sorry that I have to leave so soon. Uh, I have obligations in Chicago. We have flooding there, among other things, so I'm sort of glad I'm not there this morning. One of the best things about uh, this conference today, I think, is the emphasis that you all are going to try to look and talk about solutions. Uh, obviously, making the right diagnosis is critical, but if we never move to solutions, uh, we're not really public health folks. And this week, especially, in, in either, I've been sitting in airports, and so I've, CNN's been on all the time. I don't know how much you all have had it on here. Uh, but to see the unusual events, not as unusual as we would like to have them, that have been unfolding this week and have unfolded in the past several months, I think is a reminder to those of us, especially in public health, of the special role that we play in trying to make sure that the people of this nation have healthy lives. And part of that obligation and part of what our science teaches us is the critical role of history. I wish it were possible to function like my grandchildren and say, what do you mean? You know, what, what are you talking about? And pretend that history was unimportant. But if we're going to understand health inequities, if we're going to understand our country, if we're going to understand what direction we need to go forward in, history is there. It's walking beside us all the time, whether we pay attention to it or not. And even for most of us who are not professional historians, the more we understand 
the better we're able to figure out what's going on today and the better chance we have of trying to understand what we need to do in the future. This year, as many of you know, is the 150th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation, something that I take personally. Uh, without that proclamation, I could easily not be standing before you today. And while I don't usually tout Hollywood's approach to history, I think the film Lincoln, if you haven't seen it, you, you should, uh, plays a useful role to so many of our population that forget or never were taught history. And the interesting thing about Lincoln, to me, when I went to see it, and I, I consider myself someone who carefully studied that period of history, is it brings to life on screen how close we came to not ending slavery. And I think of that when I think about, I don't know what your personal feelings are, I know I'm here in New Mexico, but still, when I think about the vote that we just missed for background checks, for weapons, you know, I think about all the votes that are so close that we miss month after month and year after year that help determine what direction this country is going in. And so while we're going to talk today in many of your workshops about programs we think can address inequities, programs and policies that can advance not only health equity but equity in our community and nation, I'm reminded of one of my favorite quotes from Dr. King. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King said, Rarely do we find men who willingly engage in hard, solid thinking. There is an almost universal quest for easy answers, half-baked solutions. Nothing pains some people more than having to think. And I might put in as an addendum on that, we need to not so be concerned about p-values and measurable outcomes. We need to really look at the heart of what we're trying to do. This is the contribution that people in this room make to our nation. You are trained to think. The question is, what are we going to think about? You got to think about the right things. That's really our major task in public health today. We have to ask the right questions based on what we know is going on. If we ask the wrong questions, we're going to get the wrong answers. Now, asking the important questions is harder than it sounds. It's not the same as the questions you put in your logic model for your grants. Okay. Well, I want to be clear about it. I mean, you've got to do the logic model for the grants, and you've got to ask questions that you can measure. That, but those are not the right questions. Why do we see the patterns that we see? Why is the health of our indigenous people, Native Americans, the worst in the country? Why are poor children more obese than wealthier children? Why do we allow unemployment to ravage families and communities? Why do we continue to pretend that racism doesn't exist? These are the real questions. The real message that we have to bring to our communities is not that there are differences in health status. Even my grandchildren, who are still young, understand that poor people are sicker than rich people. They've seen the world long enough to know that all other things being equal, black and brown children will get the short end of the stick. The real message that we fail to bring to the American people is that there's an actual social gradient that none of us escape from. The real message is that the working class family lives shorter lives than the upper middle income family. And the upper middle income family, with all of their comforts of life, lives shorter lives than the wealthy families. This gradient operates every day. One way to think of it is to think of our nation's capital. And those of you who are familiar with the D.C. area, they have a great public transit system in D.C. 
And if you get on the train system in D.C., at the end of the line, in the suburbs, and travel into the nation's capital, for every mile that you travel toward the nation's capital, from white to black, from wealthy to poor, for every mile, every single mile that you travel, life expectancy decreases by 1.5 years. This gradient has real meaning. And so even though we may be appropriately focused on the WIC client sitting in front of us, on the teenage mom that hasn't made it to prenatal care, on the diabetic that has trouble following their diet and getting exercise, even though those things are important, even though we may work hard on meeting our grant deliverables, we know in our hearts that health is not a matter of what kind of medical system we have. It doesn't depend on our traditional, especially our categorical public health programs. Health and social well-being, friends, are the outcomes of all human activities. Talk about an outcome measure. That's it. That is the sum total outcome measure for everything that we do. It's an activity, a measure of how we do as a nation. This is why public health is so critical. This is why your work, your lens, your philosophy, your orientation is critical to the survival of the nation. You weren't surprised when the Institute of Medicine report came out earlier this year that documented once again how poorly we do in any health measure compared to nations that are similar to ours. So why is it so critical that we come together at meetings like this? What's going on in our country? Governmental public health particularly is under attack. All of public health is under attack, even the non-governmental components, but governmental public health is under attack. Think about it. In the 3,000 health departments, local health departments that we have in this country, only about a third of them even have one epidemiologist on staff. So how can we say that we're monitoring the nation's health? Since 2008, over 90% of every local health department has seen cuts, either through attrition or layoffs or furloughs and staff. By 2000, and even last year, I mean not last year, the year before last, in 2011, almost 60% of every local health department had decreased or eliminated one program. This at a time when health disparities are increasing, obesity rates are going up, we're in the midst of a major recession. It's like your house is on fire, let's lay off the firemen and disable half the trucks. 2011, even though we were theoretically under recovery, saw the largest decrease in local health department staff since the recession began. And from 2008 to 2011 in local health departments, almost 40,000 jobs were lost. In this state, 40% of local health departments lost staff through layoffs and attrition. 80% of health departments in your state made cuts to at least one program, and 60% made cuts to three or more programs. We're in trouble. And the Affordable Care Act, which is the largest and most significant health reform, not adequate, I'm a single payer person, we should have single payer yesterday. <laughs> But nonetheless, the Affordable Care Act is the largest piece of health legislation, medical financing legislation that we've been able to get passed in this generation. That huge bill gave us a tiny crumb of $15 billion in the prevention fund. Remember that? We were so happy. That's what happens. You know, when you're starving, somebody gives you a crust of bread, you think you're at Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> As of last February, they had cut from this 15 billion, 6.25 billion dollars. 
of the prevention fund is cut before we even get started. We're in trouble. I don't know if you've been on conference calls like I have about sequestration. Whoever, I never even knew that word existed before this nonsense. <laughs> so now, think about this as public policy. We can't agree, so we're going to hold a gun to each other's head, and on a certain date, if we can't agree, we're going to pull the trigger. That's my crude understanding of sequestration. right? And this is great because no idiot would pull the trigger. Well, you know, we have idiots <laughs> that we have to take some responsibility for because we elected them. They work for us, you know, even if you didn't vote for them. They have trouble understanding this concept. I try to explain this all the time to them. They don't listen to me. And you know what you do with an employee that's not doing a good job? Well, no, you do progressive discipline first. I'm a union person. And then if that doesn't work, you fire. So right now, today, as we stand here, we're going to have 25,000 fewer mammograms to low-income women in this country. We're going to see almost a half a million fewer HIV tests done by local health departments. A reduction in support for community health centers, which have been shown to be the best, most comprehensive medical care that we have in this country. 7,000 kids, 70,000 kids, at a time when the president has the nerve to call for universal preschool, 70,000 children will not be able to go to Head Start because of this ridiculous sequestration cuts. And WIC funding will be reduced by some $353 million. 600,000 WIC clients losing service. So the critical thing is, what are the important questions that we should be asking? You know, I don't know the mayor of New York. I have no personal opinion about him. He did support my new uh, uh, congressperson for the second district in Illinois. But other than that, I really have nothing to do with him. But, and, I, and I don't want to make a judgment on what he chooses to support. I, I, I agree with him on, on gun control. I, I agree with him sweetened drinks are a trouble. But is that what we need to be known for in public health, banning sweetened drinks? disproportionately from poor people. You know, he didn't ban the whatever, I can't even say the words, the cafe, ole, coochie, you know, down at Starbucks. <laughs> I Me, mean, I just go in and get black coffee. But, you know, all those other drinks that are sweet and beverage, that, those didn't get touched. Banned other sweet. Is that what we need to do as our major policy push? Or should we be concerned about the fact that people in this country don't have paid sick days? And that it has a measurable impact on our influenza epidemics every year. And we can measure the number of people who die every year in this country from flu because we can't adequately control it. Because we refuse, among other things, to give people paid sick time. Brothers and sisters, you all are mature, well-educated health professionals. You know what we need to do to be healthy. research or not. Or oh, there's some things we don't know. Like I haven't figured out how to get those 16-year-old boys to keep their zippers <laughs> zipped up. I'll go to my grave not being clear about that. <laughs> I'm not suggesting that we know everything. But the broad outlines of what people need to do to be healthy, we know and understand. And we don't talk about them. First, people need jobs. Safe secure, well-paid jobs with dignity. Without that, an individual, a family, a community is in trouble. And so when I hear talking heads or read in the newspaper people horrified that somebody might get $10 an hour, a couple with one kid, that's below poverty wages. We live in a country that still tolerates the fact that 5,000 workers, when they have a job, go to work every day and die on the job. An average of 14 workers a day 
We lose tens of thousands to occupational disease and millions to cancer and other diseases directly related to the workplace. But jobs play another role in communities. Without safe and secure jobs, people in communities can't demand what they need. It's unions and organized labor that gave us the weekend and that fight in the legislature for health care and retirement, for social security and proper and good education. In the United States of America, the gap between the rich and the poor is one of the worst in the world, and it's been growing. The economists measure this a bunch of ways. One of the common ones is a Gini coefficient. Our Gini coefficient is about equal to China. This is not something that's stable. It goes up and down. So speaking broadly for a moment about history, in the 1920s, we had one of the big gaps, like we have today, between the rich and poor in this country, the land of opportunity. And you saw, remember, what happened after the 1920s. We had the Great Depression. And from World War II until the mid-'70s, the Gini coefficient narrowed. The gap between rich and poor in this country narrowed. What else happened there? The environmental movement grew. The women's movement grew. The civil rights movement had a resurgence. I think these things are connected. So between World War II and the late 1970s, things got better in this country. And they got better faster for the poor. They got better for the well-to-do and rich too, but they got better faster for the poor and the working class, and that gap narrowed. Then in the late 1970s, something happened. I'll let you think about what happened. But then things began to reverse. Things began to shift. Policies were changed. Banks were deregulated. And the gap between the rich and poor in this country began to grow again. And so today, the top 5% of the households in America control 63% of the wealth. The bottom 80% of the population control 13% of this nation's wealth. This makes people sick. Safe, secure, well-paid jobs with dignity is critical to health. We know as public health people that we need housing and safe housing in healthy neighborhoods and communities. Not only do we need safe housing physically speaking, so we don't have rats and roaches and other things running around, but we need communities that are vibrant and organic, communities where you can walk and ride your bike safely. Communities where there are playgrounds and community centers. Communities where there are schools that actually teach kids how to read. The foreclosure crisis sweeping this country has devastated some communities more than others. This is the largest loss of wealth in the Latino and black communities in the history of our time in this nation. And the median household, which is the, lar the major source of wealth for most Americans, the median household net worth decreased during this time period for everybody. But it fell 53% for blacks, 66% for Latinos, 54% for Asians, and 16% for whites. Hard times. And these gaps in housing value and neighborhoods continue to grow and increase. What happens to a block if there are three houses that have been foreclosed on, that are empty and boarded up? We need education in order to be healthy. We know this. Many of you may participate, like I do often, in 
programs to get kids back to school to convince them not to drop out. But are we really serious about educating our children? This is the major mechanism through which we tell ourselves as Americans that we guarantee opportunity. That's what we tell ourselves. We tell ourselves it doesn't matter the income of your parents. If you go to school, you study hard, you do good, you graduate, you can make it. It's a lie. ACT scores are most, hey brother, how you doing? Got to do a shout out to my brother here. <laughs> The, the Chicago Place Matters team told me if I didn't say something to him, I would be in trouble. So, <laughs> so in some communities in Chicago, and here's, now here's something. We know about denominators in public health. We could help our colleagues in education, especially K through 12, or it's not really our teacher colleagues, it's the administrator. Count. Do you know what the uh, dropout rate is in your neighborhood, in your neighborhood school? I bet you don't. You may have some number that they tell you, but if you don't know the denominator, you don't know what's going on. Okay? So we have a, a charter school in Chicago. It's a great school. I've been to the school. I don't want to dis where they have a big ceremony every year for the past three or four years. Urban prep. It's a, it's a school for black young men. And a hundred percent of their graduating class for the past four years have gotten into an accredited four-year college. And when that happens, you know, they change the color of their tie, meaning I got accepted. It's a, it's a big deal. This is a good thing. But only 40% of the freshmen that start that school make it to be seniors. What's the dropout rate? Is it measured from the ninth grade? Is it measured from the 11th grade? Is it measured from the eighth grade? Here's a figure for you. In some communities in Chicago, Illinois, for every 100 boys, not all communities, but some communities, for every 100 black boys that start kindergarten, that's the denominator I would like to see. For every 100 black boys that start kindergarten, three graduate with a bachelor's degree by the age 25. We are in trouble. This country recently had an education commission called Equity and Excellence in Education. Google them up, read their report, and they outline a number of things for education. Are we going to pay attention to it? They call on equitable finance. We shouldn't be teaching our kids based on what neighborhood you live in and on property taxes. Creating curriculum that actually teach. Paying teachers what they deserve. Having early childhood education. Mitigating poverty efforts. That means if you have a school in a poor neighborhood, the class size shouldn't be 42 like it is in Chicago. How about having a class size of eight? And some accountability. If we fail in this process, if we continue to allow student debt at the college level be greater than credit card debt, which is where it is today, if we make education only for the rich, and if we make education with a real live person in front of you as opposed to online, a luxury only for the rich, we are digging the grave of the nation. In public health, we talk a lot about diet and exercise. Actually, I think we have some problems. I think we need some mental health in this area, but we talk a lot about it, don't we? I was so happy. I, you know, you had the fruit, but I was so happy that you had that Danish because I really needed it this morning. <laughs> so in this state with a population of a little over 2 million, 16% of the households are food insecure. 6.3% are extremely food insecure. That means you're not sure where your next meal is coming from. And over a quarter, 27% of the children of this state are food insecure. Are we really serious about nutrition? Do we pay attention to food justice? Agricultural workers in this country live with the legacy of slavery. They were excluded from Social Security for years, excluded from OSHA protection for years, and still today, agricultural workers, particularly migrant workers, particularly workers who are here without documents, whether they're working in the fields or whether they're working in processing plants or whether they're serving you your dinner that you're going to have tonight, work at slave wages and lack basic justice. 
We're not serious about nutrition. If tomorrow everybody in the United States followed whatever the latest pyramid we've invented for them, I never understand those. If everybody tomorrow followed our guidelines on nutrition, we would not have enough fruits and vegetables to feed our population. Because we've clearly designed an agricultural system that subsidizes sugar, meat, fat. They're cheaper. Vegetables, fruit, we don't subsidize. They're more expensive. And they spoil. Even me, on my doctor's salary, when I buy fruits and vegetables, I always am nervous because I know I'm going to throw away a portion of that. God forbid that I decide to go out to dinner with a friend for it, then, then that's some vegetables gone. We're not serious about nutrition because we don't ask the right questions about nutrition. We know that medical care is important to saving lives. But do we say often enough that the lack of insurance kills Americans? It's not just that the hypertensive doesn't take their medicine and is, quote, non-compliant. The reality is that we don't make getting medical care easy or cheap or convenient. And for us in 2013 to pass a law that excludes people based on white folks' papers and documents is unconscionable. Everyone in this country has a right to health care, even if you work part-time, even if you're one of the people that remain uninsured, even if you're an immigrant without documents, people that we hire in our homes, people that pay taxes, people that enrich our nation, everyone deserves medical care. The only people in our country that have a legal right to medical care are those folks that we incarcerate. That ought to be a lesson for you. <laughs> Health inequities cost us money. We estimate that in the period between 2003 and 2006, health inequities and premature deaths cost us $1.24 trillion just in that small time period. If we eliminated health disparities, for people of color, we would save, in that same three-year period, almost $230 billion. And for that same period, 2003 to 2006, we think that 30% of direct medical care expenditures for blacks and Latinos and Asians were due to excess costs because of health inequities and unable to get appropriate care at the right time. It costs us money, not only in the long term, but even in the short term. The worldwide evidence on this is overwhelming. As the WHO report remarked, this unequal distribution of health damaging experience is not in any sense a natural phenomenon, but is the result of a toxic combination of poor social policies and programs, unfair economic arrangements, and bad politics. And that's where we come in as public health folks. What are we to do? We know what we have to do. We have to first look each other and our fellow citizens in the eye and talk about real American values. Because what happened in 1980 is this notion, this concept, that we all stand as individuals, separate and apart from each other, that you have a personal responsibility for everything that happens in your life, that you need to be self-sufficient. These are important values for Americans. But I like some other values that you can see if you turn on your TV right now in Boston and in Texas. What about the values of community support? What about the value of helping your neighbor? 
What about the value of having a common, a public common ground that we all rise and sink together with? Those are American values too. This notion that we're individual islands is not a benign notion. It's a notion that says we're all middle class. And as public health people, you know that's statistically impossible. It's a notion that says, I don't want to tax the rich because I might win the lottery tomorrow. It's a notion that says collective action is futile and dangerous. That's what it really means when it says government is bad. And that notion means public health is worthless. Now, you can be a conservative public health person. I'm not talking about our crude little you know, superficial politics. I'm talking about heart and soul values. I am convinced, whether it's in the hard state of Mississippi and Alabama, or in Texas, or California, or Maine, I'm convinced that people that live in this country believe in all of our values and take pride in the fact that we live and die as a people. This disease of individualism on steroids, I think, can be cured. I think Americans believe in freedom and social solidarity. And so we need to make the policy changes that we know as public health experts will impact the health of the nation and will make all communities healthier. We know that health is not primarily a medical matter, that the social and political circumstances affect life and well-being and therefore health, and that every policy, every single policy, has a health impact, and we should evaluate it from the impact that it has on the health of the nation and on health equity. We know what we have to do, just like our colleagues around the world. We have to improve the daily living conditions of our people, the circumstances in which we are born, grow, live, work, and age. And that must include supporting the rights of workers to organize. We have to tackle head on, and I know this is hard, power, money, and resources. These are the drivers that construct the world that we're stuck with. That means for us as Americans, we have to look at class, gender, and race. And we have to establish social justice criteria for how we treat each other. And of course, we wouldn't be public health people if we didn't measure and track and survey how we do on all these policies. When school budgets are made, the health department, and if the health department can't do it for political reasons, which I understand, I am from Chicago, you have to do it through your public health associations and other organizations. You know, just like folks can, just like the NRA can have little front groups, we can have front groups too. You know, we don't have to just do it as a commissioner of health. We have to speak up when the school budgets are cut. Because when the school budgets are cut, you know there's going to be more type 2 diabetics in that high school five years later. You know that. Say that. We have to fight against this notion that we can't afford to raise taxes for common good. We don't ask people to pay when their house catches on fire, write a check, and then we'll send the fire department out. We don't do that. Because you don't want your house to catch on fire. And we have to understand that if I'm not able to go jogging in my neighborhood, which is in the middle of Hyde Park in Chicago by the University of Chicago, I live in a, I'm a doctor, I live in a nice neighborhood, I cannot go jogging in the morning if I have any sense. If I want to go jogging in the morning, then every neighborhood has to be safe. That's the only way it's going to happen. We need public health leadership from you, people sitting in this audience. We need you to ask the right questions to examine the right data, to do the stuff that's really important, the things that we know determine health. Another hero of mine, Malcolm X, said many things, and in my office is a nice poster of him with just these three words. Thinking is dangerous. You're trained to think. We need you to think. But it can be dangerous. It's never easy. So come together over these next several days and think together. 
Let's debate and argue and disagree. Let's explore. Let's take action. We'll make mistakes. But you represent the foundations of public health. And in order for public health to achieve our mission, people like you have to be brave enough to think and ask the right questions. You know that we must, must fight for social justice. You know that you have to continue to speak out. We need you to stand up, to lead, to say things that your grandchildren can understand. This is our basic obligation because public health is social justice. Thank you. My uh, students are on the shop in France, a perfectly nice, non-dangerous, frightening country, right, Frank, to appear. The law is, by law, everyone has four weeks paid vacation, by law. Okay. Now, I would suggest to you that that's healthy. <laughs> so if you ask how many Americans have four weeks paid vacation and how many take two weeks, the numbers are horrible. So it's those, starting with those kind of problems. How do we educate? For example, in Finland, I didn't know this until recently, in Finland, where they just did a big uh, education reform, it's really hard to become a teacher, K through 12 in Finland. And their teachers get paid about what their doctors get paid. And their doctors are well paid. Well, doesn't that say something about where your values are as a nation? If we really believe that education was critical to opportunity in this country, wouldn't we restructure things? I'm not saying you just throw money at a problem. Wouldn't we restructure things where more money went to education used in the right way? Okay. So it's those kind of policy questions joined with the program, sort of clinical level that we work on. I think community organizing, which is a tradition in public health, it's a small tradition, it's not the dominant tradition. But I want to remind you, uh, the visiting nurses, for example, in Chicago, um, in the early part of the century, 1908, they worked among the poor and they said, you know, we're out there organizing so the poor can rise up and take what they deserve. You know, so you know, you don't, don't put that on your monthly report to your boss. <laughs> you know, you can call it something else, community engagement. But if you're just doing community empowering, you're, you're not serious. If you understand when you do community engagement that you're helping, you're not necessarily even the lead organizers, we have to organize communities. One way to do that is to give them information. You know, when these mothers understand what cutting the school budget does to their kids' diabetes, they will be angry. And they'll work to get that gym class back and work to get playgrounds safe. Thanks, you. It's great. Hey, my name is Steve Butler. I'm a registered nurse. I've been nursing about 28 years. A big part of nursing for me is to do bedside nursing, bedside education. Um, over these years, I've learned that uh, more people can actually change behaviors, which which ultimately make change in lifestyle, which ultimately make them healthier. Is and I've learned this through my own body medicine is to get them to honor themselves more than they do, to really care about themselves, love themselves, and to. Um, so here's my so I ended up building a health fair, had a big, very big displays, health fairs, which focuses on. On a grassroots level, I'm trying to get to churches, community centers, um, just really grassroots, really talking to people. I'm amazed at the questions I get when I'm out in the public and I'm doing health care. People ask me all kinds of questions, you know, just that one on one. But yet, I've been kind of discouraged by big organizations. Oh, uh, you're not going to do anything. You don't. You don't have this. You don't have that. Um, so I guess my question, again, is, because um, I heard you say about passing information and, and, and it's really about educating people on the right information to really help them um, not so much stop drinking, stop smoking, stop eating fried chicken, but to uh, think healthy and think healthy about themselves, their family. So, and so my question to you as compared to the um, discouragement I've gotten from other people, do you think um, do you think that the, uh, people, even, even though they have low 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 economy, I mean, because 
That's why I'm going to say, I don't care what your social economic is. You can still keep, you, you might not be able to buy the best foods or all that kind of stuff, but at the same time, you can still promote your health for yourself. Um, so, 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 so to get my question is, do you think on a grassroots level, um, health education information will make a difference in people's lives? All right, so you, you put me in a hard spot because I'm a well-trained county doc and nurses are always right. <laughs> So, so work with me here. One of, the, one of the things that I think we get brainwashed in is the notion that we can have, like I said at the beginning, a quick, easy solution, even though, you know, you know, I go to Weight Watchers every Saturday at 6.30 in the morning. It's up and down, you know. I've been going there for like a year, I don't know. Anyway, so <laughs> behavioral change is really difficult, okay? So I, I don't want to, again, I don't want to belittle those critical things. If we don't, let me put it to you another way. If we change policy in Congress, okay, and, and none of us paid attention to people's high blood pressure, and I didn't go to Weight Watchers and all that kind of stuff, we would still be in trouble. So I, I don't, I, I want you to be clear, I am not saying that what we've historically done is wrong. It's just that it's not enough because we haven't done it in the right way. Here's an interesting uh, thing that's in the literature. It's, it's, it's not overwhelming, but I think it's interesting. There's some interesting notions in the literature that people that are involved in struggle, people, so for example, diabetics, they may be working in their neighborhood to, to deal with food deserts, that they actually do better with the behavioral changes than just the information about their diabetes. So yes, we have to have that individual level and community level behavioral change, but we know. How many pamphlets have we handed out on quit smoking? Yeah. We know just a pamphlet, just a health fair by itself is not going to work. The trick is how we organize the health fair, how we organize that walking club, what are they concerned about? So it's not an accident that in one of our poorest neighborhoods in Chicago, Inglewood, we had a walking club, we had group classes, group sessions, but that walking club then contacted the local university and worked with their corner stores, because that's all they had, and then the grocery stores, in trying to get healthier food in those grocery stores. I think the thing that was really healthy in that process is that they came together and organized to make positive change. So struggle, in my opinion, and struggle for policy changes are critical. So what I would say to you as one clinician to another, don't stop the clinical work, but be clear, the clinical work by itself is not gonna work. If that were true, all the pamphlets that we've handed out for all these decades would have solved the problem. So that's critical, but it's not enough. Does that make sense? Okay. I'm glad I'm still in good staying with the nurses. <laughs> we probably have uh, time for one or two more quick questions. Thank you very much for tying history to our current public health fallout. And I also want to comment on the Lincoln movie and how Hollywood doesn't get it right. I'm glad that they did acknowledge you know, the history of slavery, but what was happening at the time was still the Indian Wars and the devastation of the, the loss of land and here where you're standing today uh, from Mexico. So you know, that continued for another 50 to the present, actually, and we're still dealing with it today. And I want to urge all of our public health champions to know the history of racism in our whole country, including in the Southwest, and how it continues to keep in place the poverty that is at the root of all of our public health issues today, and how we need to organize across class lines and across racial lines. And tell us about how you've done that in your experience, please. Well, I think this is a basic lesson that, that you know, we learn hopefully from my grandmother. So, but, but let me just say, I, I, I didn't finish reading the whole program. One of the, I think, real contributions that come from uh, Native Americans around this concept and how we think about health equity is the notion of historical trauma. Okay. And, and I think that the work and, and understanding the impact of historical trauma on groups of people, even if they're totally unaware, of what's going on. So for example, the famous Tuskegee study, when we do surveys, 
most blacks don't even know what it is. Okay, they, they don't. They haven't heard about it. They can't say it's not that they they don't know what the word. They haven't heard about it. But nonetheless, that historical trauma uh, typified by the Tuskegee study is real and felt. So I, I think that one of the real tragedies in our country is that we've allowed ourselves to be siloed, uh, siloed one against each other. And people don't have a good understanding of the whole total history of this country. Not only the history of people of color, which stands out in terms of oppression and racism, but also the history of European immigrants and the different waves of immigration, etc. So I think you're absolutely right. Having a clear understanding of the total history is critical. In Chicago, we are fortunate because we're in the middle of the country. We have uh, one of the largest Native American urban populations. We have Koreans. We have everybody. We have the whole world in Chicago because we're in the middle of the country. But everywhere you are, I love. I, I text one of my friends. I was looking at your uh, program. I said, I'm going to go to this great workshop called How to Work with Statistically Insignificant Communities. I'm sorry. <laughs> the New Mexico black population. I said, cool. You know, I know I live in New Mexico. So, so I think the critical thing is, is exactly that. We have to come to each other with respect. We have to understand what's going on. Um, the, the politics in this part of the country is uh, more complicated because you have sovereign, quasi-sovereign, sovereign nations here. And so having programs that pay attention to those cultural traditions, having programs that pay attention to those legal realities, having programs that allow us to unite across communities becomes important. In Chicago, our most recent uh, campaign that really united white, middle class, Latino, Asian, Chinese, has been our struggle around our schools. And so the support, for example, for the Chicago teachers' strike uh, and for the against these school closing has really brought out everyone from every community fighting to say we don't want any school closed, we want all children in Chicago to get a good education. That's the kind of demand that's really at the heart of the best of this country. Speaking of history, <clears throat> excuse me, I have a cold, but speaking of history, I'd like to ask you a question about future history. Uh, I take, I, I take your uh, lessons about organizing, but I look what, at what's happening in this country now. Take workers' rights, for example. Up in your area of the country, there are a couple of states who have just abolished workers' rights, despite a lot of organizing and taking over state houses, etc. Uh, look at gun control. We had more organization around gun control over the last couple of weeks than we've ever seen in our lives, and we just voted down yesterday. The question is, do you think that this is a whole paradigm shift in this country, or you be, do you think this is a pendulum swing? Are we seeing something historic here in the change of public health and public policy, or is it going to go back the other way? <laughs> You're getting in your exercise today. I appreciate it. Uh, I think it's a very important question. I think we make a mistake when we think about pendulum swings, uh, and I'll come back to that. In America, we're Americans, and we think about campaigns. You know, we think we can have a campaign and we win and we go home. It doesn't work like that. The 1960s was a resurgence of. It wasn't like the beginning of the civil rights movement. It was a resurgence. Okay. So, so one thing is our notion. This, this is a. a a national trait is unfortunate. You know, if you if you go to Greece or France, or you get in a cab with a taxi driver, their sense of history in their country is profound. Here, people have trouble remembering 20 years ago. So, so let me. So, I don't think we should expect after organizing around Newtown that all of a sudden we would win with the with the gun control. We have to have a longer view of what's going on because how we got here took so long. Um, I recently, I don't usually do this because I'm not, I'm not a historian, but I, you know, I'm interested in history that impacts me, and it all impacts me, so, but you know. So recently I've been reading a little bit about the history of right, the right wing. Because I'm saying like, how do we keep getting my 
our aunts is beat by these people. You what's going on? You know, really? That's what I was trying to find out. Like, how come they keep winning and we keep losing? And and I'm not. I, I don't put this out as a serious historical comment. I'm just. Gonna, so one thing that fascinated me was a number of people traced this back as far as World War One and Two, and, and really talked about the anger that existed from Franklin Delano Roosevelt's term in office, and argue. Now think about that. Argue about efforts to change policy that they profoundly disagree with in terms of, say, banking regulations. Going back that far, and these people had money, okay? So I'm saying to myself, if they have that kind of decade-long view and can put resources in historically, we have not been able to put on these kind of things, then we really have been thinking about this wrong, you know? Um, there's nothing more profound, I think, politically in my life that, that I will ever see other than the election of a black president. I thought I would never thought I would see that. Now, do I think he is a progressive president? No, but I knew him ahead of time, so I'm not surprised or disappointed. He's a great guy, but I don't know. But I never thought that was going to solve all the problems. Okay. So what I say to you is, this is not a pendulum swing. It's been a slow erosion and twisting of, of a direction for this country. It's deep-rooted, and we have to confront it directly. And I think we're in a different place historically. You know, racism is still alive and well, don't misunderstand me. But we're in a different place in terms of how we're able to talk about racism in this country, how we're able to talk about uh, the fact that we stole the northern half of Mexico, or how we're able to talk about the fact that we you know, don't do our treaty obligations. We can have a different kind of conversation, and we really have to ask those right questions to win that battle. The battle really isn't up here with the vote in Congress. That's where we tend to operate. We need six more votes in the Senate. No, we need to win hearts and minds of our fellow folks in this country. And we need to do it by asking hard questions and having hard conversations. There will be disagreement, but I have faith in human nature. And I have faith that people want basically the same thing for themselves and their families. So it's going to be a long struggle, but if we can get out of the campaign mode and thinking we just have to pass this one law or win this one vote, if we can really go back to the local communities and really talk about things that are really important, then I think we can make headway. Thank you so much.